Hey, y'all, it's Joe Gilder. Sorry, I'm back. If you are watching this in real time, and you notice I took a couple weeks off for the holidays, and it was great, and I'm really glad I spent a lot of time with the kids and the wife, but now I'm back, and we're going to keep plugging along on this mix. Before I jump in, though, if you've been watching this series, there's a playlist in YouTube, which you can see here. Uh, they'll all be there if you want to catch up. Also, you can see them all over here just at homestudiocorner.com. If you click on that cute little thing right there, it'll allow you to switch and watch whatever video you want. And also, if you click here, you can enter your email address, and I'll send you a download link for the tracks that we're mixing in this series. They're for free. Check it out. Uh, you'll get the most out of this if you mix along with me, hence the name Mixed Together. So if we look at um, the most recent set of videos, we've been diving into th drums mostly. So mix bus compression, in snare tone, overhead and room mics, fat snares, distorted rooms. So I feel like the drums should be pretty close. Also, I'd like to start making some more progress on this. I don't want this series to drag out forever because mixing doesn't have to drag out forever. Uh, and maybe we can jump into new songs and keep this fresh. But um, I do want to be thorough as well. So I'll try my best to do both. Let's take a quick listen and hear what we have thus far. I gotta be honest, it's actually sounding better than I thought it was uh, <laughs> coming in here to do this video. Uh, I was expecting to have to do some more work, but it's actually feeling pretty good. So I'm gonna just go down the line. So we've done, we've, we focused a lot of our attention and our time on drums. Uh, so we did the, we actually split the drums up, as you'll remember. We've got the spot drum mics, so kick, snare, toms, I think hi hat maybe coming through here. There they are. And then we've got the overhead in the rooms coming through their own bus. So I can slam the spot mics with a compressor and have it not touch the overhead in the rooms, which is working out kind of cool. And we also did some fun stuff to the room mics. Uh, distortion, just weird stuff. Go back and watch that video if you want to see more. And then those are all feeding into my drum bus, which as of right now has nothing on it. It's just a volume control because all the processing is on these two buses. As you've probably noticed, I like me some buses. So I'm going to kind of just move on down the line um, and look at bass. Now, the bass tracks for this song we recorded, this is my brother-in-law, Joel Bazaire. You can check him out at NashvilleBassWorks.com. Uh, there should be a link below. If there's not, let me know, and I'll put the link there. Um, so the way we recorded this was we've got a DI signal, which is just a direct into, uh, I think, his Groove Tubes Brick preamp, which is super gnarly and awesome. Um, so that's pretty cool for DI signal. Sounds like a bass, right? Sounds like a direct bass. I almost never use just that sound, just the direct bass sound. Now with Joel, he tends to add some overdrive, a little bit of grit to his bass tone anyway. Uh, but if I get a super, super clean bass sound, I'm usually going to do that as well, just to help it cut through a little more. Here's the uh, amp we recorded on his. He's got one of those. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, if you've never seen it, if you're a bass player and you're, you're pressed for space and or the ability to uh, get too, too loud, he's got one of these, and it is just the coolest. It's, the Amp it's from Ampeg, but it's their micro VR stack. Now, is it the same as one of their big, huge stacks with 810s? No, I mean, it's not the same, but it's, got, it's in that ballpark, though. It's got that kind of that growl. It looks like it, and if you're looking at this, this comes up to like my middle of my thigh it's 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 very small these are eight inch speakers i believe no they're tens but they just barely squeeze in there so it's very narrow and take doesn't take up a lot of space which is kind of cool but anyway that's what we recorded uh on this i believe it's been a while but i think that's what it was and here's what that amp sounds like by itself so it's got a lot of the dirt in it kind of a grit so i may not have to add much to this at all to get the tone that I want. You'll notice on our bass bus, I did have 
uh, pulled out around, what frequency is that? Show me. Come on, show me. Come on. Wow, I just wasted a ton of time. Could have just clicked on it. Uh, we took out at about 150 hertz, which is pretty typical. Um, I don't want to remove all mid-range on bass, but sometimes that builds up too much and isn't balanced. And I don't hear the low lows as well or the grit up top. So we've done that. One thing we haven't done, or we may have done it and I forgot, is occasionally when you use a DI signal and an amp signal, sometimes those two can get out of phase uh, depending on how the mic is wired or just the if the mic was a little farther away from the cabinet, so the direct signal signal is going to be super direct, and then the mic signal is going to be um, delayed a little bit. You'll notice if you get these tracks, if you download them, the it, it was done in stereo, which is just the way it exported from Joel's system. Uh, it doesn't have to be stereo. I'm not making a case for stereo bass at all. Um, if anything, it doesn't really serve a purpose um, in this context. But rather than I just left it as is, because that's exactly how I received them from Joel, which is fine. And then I brought it into my session, and then I sent those files to you. So that's why it's like that. If you want to go in and make them mono files um, just to save voices and things like that, feel free. There's no rule against that. Uh, but let me just real quickly, when I zoom in, they look pretty much lined up. The amp is a little delayed, which is to be expected. And you can do one of two things. You can try to manually pull it back and line them up, which is certainly good. I just, I think it's a little too nerdy for me, and I just, I would rather just throw a plug in on there, flip the polarity, uh, invert the phase as they say, and then just see which way sounds better. So let's do that real quickly. Just listening to um, bass, the two basses, I'm gonna just turn this plug in on and off and see which way sounds better. Now, there will be comments that say, Joe, you're only, by flipping the polarity, you're really only checking two possible options. You should really line them up and do all that stuff. And you're, you're completely right. You can completely do that. I don't think it needs it because neither, actually both tones sound kind of cool. One t seems to have more low end, but I think it's really just, it's ducking down some of that mid range. And then the other one had a little more attack. I'm going to leave it alone because I think it sounds fine as it is. And if I ever find myself at a point in the mix where I just, I'm not getting the bass tone that I want and I'm using really drastic measures, then I may go back and look at that again. But to me, that sounds pretty good. So the big thing I want to address is the a little bit of inconsistency in the bass. So he played on his five string on this, which is great, but just means when you go down to that low B string, it's going to be beefy. There's really no way around that B string being slightly louder or fuller than, so when he goes the da -na 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 -da -na -da -da, those last two notes I believe are on the B string, so they come through just a lot louder, and he's a consistent bass player. He, see, that's the thing. He's consistent, but those notes still get a little louder when it comes through. So I'm going to use a compressor in more of just a clinical sort of method just trying to control that volume and get it to be a little more consistent. So it won't, this isn't so much for tone. I'm digging the tone already. Uh, I just need the bass to be a little more consistent volume wise. So I'm going to go pretty fast attack. Uh, I'm sorry, pretty, pretty high ratio. So it's hitting it pretty well. And I'm going to leave the attack at like 70 for now. I like to leave lots of space for bass. I'll bring it back if I need to, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if this works. So let's just pull back and take a listen. not catching the notes like I want it to. So I'm going to go faster attack, like 20, but really turn it up so it's just catching those peaks.
<laughs> I was just talking without my mic on, sorry. Um, so the, the compression wasn't doing a lot for me, so I turned it off, and I'm going to go look and just see what the frequencies are doing, because the parts that sounded louder to my ears that weren't coming through um, weren't showing up as actually louder on the meter. So it makes me think maybe there's more frequency, certain frequencies that are jumping out more than others. So I'm going to look at the EQ, just the readout here, and just see what's happening there. So there's some really, really deep low end stuff that's coming through. And as you may recall, I did a high pass filter at 31 hertz. It's not really doing much there. It was just more just a kind of to catch the really, really low stuff. I'm gonna hit play and try to listen to drums and bass and just see where I, how much I can get away with taking off so that low end doesn't come through and make the bass suddenly seem louder for just a couple of notes. So let's just play with that for a little bit here. Okay, so 120 was obviously too high when he goes do 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 do. That low note disappeared. So we need some of that. So let's back it off and see what happens. So I'm not completely convinced the high pass is the way to go. It's taking it just takes too much away. Let's take our low frequency dealy bob and let's find the frequency that's being so annoying. So let me solo bass. So there's just a lot. You probably can't hear it where you're listening unless you got it on big speakers. But when I boosted down here at like 40 hertz, my speakers went blah, blah, blah. like they really resonated because there's just a lot of information there. And so rather than trying to control that with a kind of a higher, a higher sloped filter, I'm going to use uh, EQ band and kind of just pull that down and see how that works. There's a lot of resonance there at 80 as well. So I'm going to do a little bit of a cut there and see if that fixes it. It's starting to look like too much EQ, so which tells me I may need to rethink my decision here. Okay, I just tried to flip the polarity again just to go back and hear it against the drums and see if that was right. I don't think that's the right thing, but maybe I've got just too much in both. Maybe I need to EQ each separately, each bass part. Let's listen to those. Okay, it's got a lot of beefiness to it. Okay, I tried it with just the just the amp track. It didn't. It got too lost. So I think that it sounds best with the two together. So my next approach is going to be a little bit of. Hmm. Let's do some parallel something here. 
So as you've probably recalled, uh, I love me some the red light distortion here, which is down here. Why can't I find it? I'm going to put it on this track. I'm going to replace that EQ for now. And I'm going to do something that's unique to Studio One. So if you don't have Studio One, you can't do this. Um, but that's okay. You can figure this out. This is essentially parallel processing, except uh, I can do it on the individual track. So I can split the signal and send half of it through, send it essentially through this distortion and then not through it, and then blend between the two using this volume or the actual settings on the plugin itself. So, and I can disconnect either side if I want to just listen to one. Forget how to do that. There we go, gotta click somewhere like here. Okay, so now I'm just listening to the distorted side and let's just dial in that tone real quick. Now, I know what you're thinking, that sounds ridiculously bad. <laughs> but when we blend it with the original, it starts to be kind of cool. Now, something else I've noticed over the years, and I think I heard this from my buddy Graham. You heard of Graham Cochran? Yeah, he's a cool guy. Um, he, we were mixing something together once, and he suggested flipping the polarity of the distorted signal because sometimes that can make it doing it in parallel sometimes it can make it take too much low end away so let's just try that turning this mix tool on and off see which one sounds better <laughs> this is worth repeating i'll turn it up a little bit so here it is as we had it we have the signal split between the two normal parallel processing added distortion to one and it sounds like this very mid-range heavy, the low end is kind of starting to disappear, which is kind of happens when you add in distortion. Flipping the polarity, or flipping the phase of the distorted side, and that's the only thing I'm changing, uh, gets way beefier. So I'm gonna hit play and then flip it and listen to what happens. It's almost like it may be a flaw in the way this distortion pedal plug-in works. It may be flipping the polarity depending on what settings you have, just the way it's messing with the signal. Um, that could be the case. I'm not sure. PreSonus, if you're watching this, maybe just take a look at that. But anytime you parallel process anything, there's a good chance that one side will get delayed a little bit or just enough to where it's kind of womp, cattywampus out of phase with the other. And just flipping the polarity, you've seen me do that time and time again here. It's a nerdy little tool, but it can really help. Um, in the mix, listen to what happens now. Now, I would argue that's too much. Uh, it needs a little bit of that grit. Uh, if we listen again to the distorted side. We can probably bring that down. So I'm going to use this. Bring it down a few dB. Now I'll bring in EQ after all the distortion and see how that feels.
That section suffers um, from this, but I feel like the rest of it works pretty well. One thing I always like to do, because as I mentioned at the very beginning of this series, I told you I'm going to do this like I do it in real life. I'm going to try stuff not knowing if it's going to work, and it may fail. I've already undid several things I've done just in this video, and I may come back in a future video and say, forget all this distortion stuff, it's ridiculous, but I, it just felt like the right thing. One thing that's great to do is to just turn on and off the plugins on a given track once you've done some stuff and just see if you're helping it. Hopefully it's level matched to where it's not adding volume, but even if it is, you can still hear if the tone is kind of going in the direction you want. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit play and just turn this on and off listening to the bass and see have we helped or hurt it. Okay, so listening, if you were watching, I went back, removed some of the distortion. I just dialed the drive. Whoops, I just messed that up. I dialed the drive back a fair amount and then EQ'd a little more of the upper mids up to catch a little of the distortion. It was too much to the point of the bass went from being do 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 to kind of so that was too much. It was too much distortion. As is pretty typical for me, I will do things too much and then dial it back. Um, and that feels a little bit better to me. Let's go to that last course we listen to a lot and see how that's working. So just then I pulled out my trusty Sennheiser HD 650 headphones, which are fabulous headphones. They're expensive, but they are very accurate and have a nice big low end to them that lets you hear the low end very accurately. My room has some funniness in the lower mid, so when I'm starting to feel like I'm kind of battling myself on the low end, I'll check it on there and it feels very nice. So if you've been listening on headphones the entire time, you kind of hear what I heard just then. Uh, which is when I just at the end when I was turning the plugins on and off, I heard without the plugins the bass was very kind of wah 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 very mid range heavy, but not something it'd be the kind of thing if I just EQ'd that frequency out, I'd kind of lose the bass altogether. Uh, it was the only thing that let it cut through and be heard other than felt. And you want bass to be felt, but you also want it to be heard. So by adding in the distortion and blending the two and EQing that, 
the bass went from being kind of wah, 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 to do 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 if that makes sense. So then it has a little more top end and the low end is there, but there's the right amount of mid-range to keep it full in that lower mid section as well. So I feel like we did pretty good work. We went from this tone to this. Which to my ear sounds like the exact same tone with something layered over the top to help it out, which I think worked well. All right, that's it for this video. We have mangled bass. We've mangled drums. We've done a little mangling on other stuff. we got more mangling to do, so stick around. And don't forget to get your tracks over at homestudiocorner.com. They're waiting for you. See ya.